Hey YouTubers, this is the GSTV viewer coming at you with another video for you guys today. So I'm actually going to be doing a rankings video of some of my personal favorite Power Ranger seasons over the years. Now this is actually going to be divided into separate parts. So in this case with part one, I'm going to be tackling the Power Ranger seasons from the original Saban era, Mighty Morphin the Wild Force, and then going forward with the Disney era with Ninja Storm to RPM and even to the Neo Saban era with Samurai to Super Ninja Steel. So I'm basically going to be covering some of these Power Ranger seasons just to kind of rank some of my personal favorite seasons from least favorite to favorite. And the same will apply with the Disney era and the Neo Saban era. So just to kind of cover through the many different phases of the franchise throughout the past 25 years or so that the franchise has been running. Now this is one of those videos because I haven't really done that many Power Ranger videos in quite some time. I know I did one with Beast Morphers where I was basically discussing my brief thoughts on the premiere episode. And other than that, I haven't really done that many Power Ranger videos in quite some time. I mean, ever since Saban had been falsely flagging many videos concerning about people's opinions on the current state of the franchise. So they've been pretty sensitive with the negative press that they've been receiving. And even they flag some of my videos, especially some of the retrospective reviews on some of the past Power Ranger seasons. So it got to a point where I was basically told myself that I wasn't going to even be doing any Power Ranger videos in the near future. Now that Hasbro has bought out Power Rangers from Saban, so I want to kind of get back on track with that and do some Power Ranger related topics as well. Introduction aside, I might as well just kind of kick things up a notch and just kind of go into detail regarding about these particular Power Ranger seasons and where I have them on the list. So without further ado, might as well just start off at that. So to start off this video, I might as well just cover Power Rangers Turbo here. Now Turbo was pretty low on this list out of the many seasons from the original Saban heyday. Now Turbo was a season that a lot of folks, including myself, weren't very fond of. Now I do have a number of reasons as to why I feel that way and it's not so much the fact that the idea of having a child being a Power Ranger weighed it down for me but there was a lot of other factors that kind of turned me off as a viewer when it comes to watching Turbo and looking at the first half of the season you had the introduction of Divatox being the main villain of that respective series. And Diotox had this habit of launching these detonators throughout every episode where it seemed like she's making attempts at planning these explosives. She would be planning these explosives throughout Angel Grove and 9 times out of 10 those explosives don't activate and it's basically rinse and repeat. And then you even factoring in uh, some of the Power Rangers that have stuck around from the original Mighty Morphin heyday. I mean, those Rangers were kind of, to be honest, they were kind of getting stale at this point. I mean, especially uh, Tommy at this point, because he had been on the show since the, the original, obviously the original series. But especially being uh, part of the, uh, the original core Power Rangers with the Jasons, the Trinis, the Zacks, the Kimberleys, the Billies. He had stuck with the franchise for as long as he had been, even despite all the cast changes that have been uh, occurring throughout his course as a Power Ranger. And by the time he got to Turbo, you know, it just kind of feels like he kind of lost his mojo compared to his time as like the Green Ranger and even as the White Ranger. He's definitely had a lot of focus even going into Zeo. But then you get to the Turbo and you saw him less and less and he was more focused on becoming an aspiring race car driver, which really didn't make any sense because 
Tommy never really had any passion or desire of being a race car driver. And this was also the season that the Power Rangers would graduate from high school and they would focus more on attending college and even trying to get some jobs. It just didn't really pan out in the long run. And speaking of that, you got to some of the cast changes. I mean, not only Justin going on to replace Rocky, but even some of the cast changes to the rest of the four Rangers, you know, when uh, Tommy, Tanya, Kat, and Adam would pass the torch over to the likes of some of the new set of Rangers with TJ, Carlos, Ashley, and Cassie. This also coincided with the outing of Doug Sloan, who had also been writing for Power Rangers since Mighty Morphin all the way up to the early half of Turbo. So they replaced him with Judd Lynn, and he would uh, take over as the head executive writer for Turbo up until Time Force. It was just a lot of massive upheaval. Even Zordon and the original Alpha out being Alpha 5 would also leave the series in order to go back to uh, the planet Eltar. So they got replaced with Demetria and a different Alpha with Alpha 6, who had one of the most annoying accents of... Uh, of a supporting character, I guess you could say, compared to Alpha 5, where it's like, ay yeah 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 yay But now we're going to deal with Alpha 6, trying to be all hip and cool. It's like, yo, 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 with this kind of like street thuggish attitude, which is just so cringeworthy, even looking back at that as an adult. But gladly that they ended up uh, reconfiguring his voice with a more uh, faithful uh, adaptation of the alpha that we all grew to love now it was a different voice actor i think the actress that would go on to place uh the original alpha six i think it was like wendy lee who was also uh in a famous anime voice actor so yeah the, she would eventually take over that role of alpha six going into space and lost galaxy there was actually some pretty good stuff also the phantom ranger story arc was one of the very good uh, aspects of the season was the introduction of the Phantom Ranger. They brought him in and he had this kind of mysterious presence. You could never tell exactly when he'll show up because obviously being his name and that he had his, um, you know, he had the usage of using stealth mode to prevent anyone from even seeing him. Cassie had a crush on the Phantom Ranger. We also got the addition of General Havoc, who was also this uh, another like mini villain that even went as far as using his own set of foot soldiers to hijack the Turbo Megazord. So the Power Rangers had to end up finding this new um, Megazord, which would be the uh, Rescue Megazord. But yeah, there was actually some pretty good stuff that they did throughout that story arc and General Havoc being a very intimidating villain. A lot more uh, darker and sinister compared to the kind of like the lighthearted and hokiness that Diva Tox was known for. So it was basically a precursor of a sign of things to come for Power Rangers because this would be laying the groundwork for some of the, the seriousness that we, we would have by the time we get to chase into space, which would be the transition from Turbo to obviously the name of the season being Power Rangers in space. Chasing the Space was also a really good uh, season finale episode. The power chamber ends up getting destroyed. The Power Rangers would lose their powers. And, you know, TJ and the rest of the folks pledged note that they would uh, figure out a way to find Zordon. Because prior to that, uh, Demetria had informed them that Zordon had been kidnapped by Dark Spectre. And that the Rangers originally were going to protect the Earth, but when Demetria leaves and the entire power chamber is completely destroyed, so that combined with the Turbo Rangers losing their powers, it's like, what do we do next? And also another uh, side story is that Justin, you know, his father ends up getting a new job working at the Nasada space shuttle. Justin uses his father's influence in order to uh, direct the rangers over to the space shuttle so they had to like sneak in the shuttle without being caught and the rangers would get sent into space so they had to go find zordon that was actually a really great season finale and i know i kind of stressed out about justin 
and just his and just the criticism that a lot of folks had and the idea of a child being a power ranger now i understand where they were trying to go with that idea uh, i just kind of felt there was just a lot of things that just kind of felt like they could have been executed better because the way that they had justin the way that he was chosen to be the blue ranger I mean, it just kind of came out of nowhere because like half, like 30 minutes into the movie, it's like all of a sudden Zoran recruits him as a Power Ranger just because Justin just randomly eavesdrop on the Power Rangers conversation when they were uh, looking over at Rocky because Rocky got uh, injured during karate practice. So the Rangers had to check to see how their friend was doing. And little did they realize that Justin was hiding under the hospital bed it was just one of those like very cheap excuses. And I really feel that Justin's way of becoming a Power Ranger should have been handled a lot better, in my opinion. I mean, if you look at some of the other um, replacement Rangers up in that point, you know, Rocky, Adam, and Aisha. Because, you know, they were introduced, but they didn't become Power Rangers right away. I mean, granted, they would find out that Tommy and uh, Kimberly and Billy would be Power Rangers. And they had to, like, earn their trust throughout the next several episodes. And then, you know, once you got to the power transfer, you know, when it was time for Jason, Trini, and Zach to pass the torch over to their successors, there, I mean, there was, they took their time for them to really get us accustomed to their presence on the show and showing that, you know, the idea of, you know, you may not be a Power Ranger, but at least you could, you know, contribute to the team and earning their trust, even Legend knows not to tell anyone and, you know, that they could still contribute into helping them. So there was definitely build up there. Look at Catherine, you know, season three of Mighty Morphin. They brought her in as Rita's servant. She even goes as far as stealing Kimberly's power coin and almost to the point where she nearly murdered her. And, you know, Kat just has her insecurities and feeling that she did something wrong. And, you know, and she kind of feels like, why am I doing this? Why am I hurting uh, uh, my best friend? And then so she had to kind of redeem herself by uh, retrieving the power coin that she stole. And then uh, initially giving it back to Kimberly, only for Kimberly to pass the torch back to Kat. Kat did perform a good deed and, you know, eventually uh, became... Kimberly's successor as the Pink Power Ranger. But that's kind of the problem that I had with Justin. It's like there was never any build up to him leading them becoming a Power Ranger. And I think that was also one of the things that I think a lot of people kind of feel sour about to this day in the way that he was built to be, uh, you know, Power Ranger. Obviously, because Beetleborgs was also a huge hit. So Saban thought that lightning would strike twice. It's like if it worked. For the Beetleborgs, if we had the idea of having kids becoming superheroes, then that's got to work with Power Rangers, right? Well, not quite. The idea of a child ranger would eventually be debunked and, you know, Justin would be written off at the end of Turbo. Although he would come back for one more episode with True Blue to the Rescue with Power Rangers in Space. So we haven't really had been seeing or hearing any mentions about Justin ever since. It's just one of those experiments that just didn't really work out in the long run. Also another reason why I felt I think that a lot of people didn't like it was just the uh, comedy slapstick. Because you know, with Turbo taking footage from a Super Sentai series with Car Ranger, which is also very noted for its uh, usage of satire and a lot of comedy slapstick that was implemented into that season so turbo had to kind of embrace that sort of aspect and i think when turbo was originally conceived it was supposed to be built as this sort of like very serious overtones and that didn't really pan out the way that originally that was going to be planned and then judd lynn takes over doug sloan and the second half of Turbo, they start to embrace some of the goofy aspects, like the Power Rangers getting baked in the giant pizza. Turbo, I mean, definitely did have its bright moments, but I think there was just a lot more that needed to be desired. It really shows that Turbo was really showing just how stale Power Rangers has gotten, because you could only do the lighthearted 
comedy slapstick for so long, it's like, you know, what are you going to do? You know, and it's very episodic. And we don't really get to learn more about the Power Rangers outside their personalities. And even the villains were very one-dimensional as well. So by the time we get to uh, Power Rangers in Space, we get to see a lot more characters that have multi-dimensional aspects of them. Especially with the villains of space with Astronema, Ecliptor, Dakanda, etc, etc, etc. I think Turbo really kind of showed that... You know, that the formula that they were already using at that point wasn't going to last. Despite that, I mean, Turbo, while it did definitely have its moments, I think there was just a lot of elements, I think, that kind of turned away from a lot of fans. Although, in hindsight, there have been worse Power Ranger seasons than Turbo. But at that time, I mean, this was the season I think the general public just completely gave up on Power Rangers. Which is really shame, because there have also been pretty good seasons even after Turbo. You know, it is what it is. And now, moving onward to the next Power Rangers season that I have on this list, uh, Lightspeed Rescue. Now, Lightspeed Rescue was the first Power Rangers season where there are completely no ties to the original series. No characters from Mighty Morphin. You know, with Lightspeed, it was more of a back-to-basics Power Rangers season. Lightspeed, unlike previous seasons where the Power Rangers had to keep their identities a secret, but here in Lightspeed, everyone around them knows that they're the Power Rangers. You had Carter, you had Chad, Joel, Kelsey, and Dana, who are the Lightspeed Rangers of that season. Everyone around Mariner Bay knows who the Power Rangers are. They get hired by this captain named William Mitchell, or better known as being Captain Mitchell, who was like their mentor of the season. So he operates this military headquarters that's located underneath the ocean being the Lightspeed Aqua Base. So he recruits these five young adults with particular backgrounds and you know Carter being a firefighter, Chad being a swimmer, Kelsey being like an, an extreme sports athlete, Dana an aspiring nurse, and Joel being the sky cowboy. So you have all these Five young adults being recruited and being that the Pink Ranger being Dana being the daughter of the mentor of the season Ryan um, the sixth Power Ranger being going on to become the Titanium Ranger uh, so that was also another noteworthy aspect of the season that I really liked was the first American exclusive Power Ranger now Lightspeed its Sentai footage being Go Go V did not have a six Power Ranger. And so uh, the executives over from Saban decided to kind of come up with the creation of the Titanium Ranger. They had Ryan being introduced in the series, being the son of Captain Mitchell and the brother of the Pink Ranger. I mean, there was actually a pretty interesting backstory that happened where Ryan gets abducted by diabolico and to perform his duty as the titanium ranger and even originally going out his way to annihilate the power rangers and all of mariner bay so basically a take on green with evil i mean i definitely really like the idea of a titanium ranger i definitely really like ryan as uh, a power ranger so i thought that was pretty cool um unfortunately he did not stick around for very long because even though the Titanium Ranger would be used throughout a couple episodes in Lightspeed, but there was at a point where Ryan had to leave Mariner Bay in order to find the tombs or find a certain artifact to lock away the demons that escaped from the tomb back to the Shadow World. Because the Titanium Ranger wasn't present in Gogo -Go V, and because of likely due to cost-cutting measures, so they couldn't really like shoot a lot of American exclusive footage. So Ryan had to leave the series. They had to like write him off. There weren't really that many story arcs in Lightspeed. I think that was the, another um, flaw I think this season had compared to the previous two seasons with Space and Lost Galaxy. Because Space had Andros having to find what happened to his sister... And only to find out that his sister happens to be the main villain of the season. 
and they also had to deal with you know other uh personal shenanigans as well like having to search for zordon and just a lot of like interwoven plots throughout space i think that was a problem that i think lightspeed had was just the lack of like concrete story arcs even lost galaxy had the magna defender and the search for the lights of orion they had to deal with Trakina's rise to the throne after the galaxy rangers destroyed scorpius yeah so there wasn't really that much in terms of story with lightspeed and I think that was also kind of the thing that really kind of weighed it down to an extent. But that's not to say Lightspeed was completely bad. I definitely really like uh, some of the episodes with some of our Rangers, you know, with Carter. Because, you know, being Carter, the professional badass that he is. Because, you know, he gets to kick all sorts of ass and even had some moments where he even risked his life to not only protect the Power Rangers, but also protect the entire city. And there was a moment where I remember where Carter even threatened uh, one of the creatures of the week. I believe his name was Demonite, which was obviously a pun for demon and a dynamite. Carter even stuck his uh, weapons at the Demonite and even going out as far as even sacrificing himself to save the city. And it turns out that he barely survived. There was also uh, a moment where he witnessed a child getting hurt when he was trying to extinguish the fire in the parking lot tunnel, I believe. And like one of the civilians got hurt, that particularly being the kid, and he had to get rushed to the hospital. I remember watching that for the first time and I was just so mind blown because we haven't really seen that many uh, scenes like that. I mean, I know in Mighty Morphin, you had like Kimberly getting knocked unconscious in the third season because she was overworking herself and she was training for the pan global games but i mean here it was a it was pretty intense you know seeing a kid get hurt and carter starting to doubt himself and we would get to see a little more of that even a season later in time force where wes's father ends up getting injured and rushed to the hospital and even got to a point where he almost died some of the carter focus episodes were really cool and even the episode where he finds out that Captain Mitchell was the person that was rescuing Carter as a child during a fire. And that explaining how Carter got to be a firefighter and thus being a Power Rangers. I think there was also a pretty unique episode where Dana had to confront with this burglar who was hijacking a charter bus. And then uh, I think there was also like a volcano that was erupting and then the burglar had to rescue the passengers in the charter bus so really try to make up for uh, some of the crimes that he's been committing so i thought that was actually a pretty cool episode it was it was actually pretty intense also because he was like the burglar was actually using what looked like a legit handgun which is something that you wouldn't even see during the heyday of power rangers that being mighty Morphin, because you know at this point when lightspeed was airing i mean power rangers wasn't necessarily the uh, juggernaut phenomenon that it used to be because you know even this is during the time of the anime craze with stuff like pokemon and digimon being kind of like the end thing the fact that they were even using a handgun in lightspeed was actually something that really caught me off guard as well uh, even threatening to kill some of the civilians and even potentially dana who was a power ranger some pretty noteworthy moments i could remember watching lightspeed rescue there were some pretty dud episodes like Yesterday Again, which was basically like a Groundhog Day episode where Carter was testing out this simulation. He keeps on uh, reliving the same day over and over and over again. And there was like an episode where Chad dates a mermaid. Um, so there, yeah, there were just some episodes, I think during the middle half of the season, that it really kind of showed just how directionless that the season could be. And yeah, the villains, they just kind of lack the kind of characteristics that some of the previous seasons had. When it's all said and done, I mean, I definitely I definitely think that Lightspeed had its moments. It wasn't a completely bad season. Uh, I do think it does get very underrated in this day and age. And then we get over to uh, Wild Force. I mean, this was like coming off the heels of a very intense season with Time Force. And then you kind of get over to Wild Force. It was pretty noble for a number of things because... Not only this would be the last season to be produced by Saban, but 
I mean, this would also be the end of an era for Fox Kids because this would also be the last Power Rangers season to air on that block. And it would be shortly after that it would move over to um, ABC Family, which is now Freeform, when Disney purchased Saban. So, yeah, this was, uh, I mean, Wild Force, I mean, this was a season that I didn't watch the entire series as a whole for the first time when it originally aired. But I did kind of tune in from time to time. And it wasn't until many years later when I started watching the whole season on the YouTube. Now, this was like before, you know, Saban purchased it back and then they started uh, taking down all these Power Ranger episodes. But I remember um, watching uh, the entire Wild Force season uh, right around the time that RPM was there. And looking back at this season, I mean, it wasn't like a terrible season, but it wasn't like the greatest season either. I mean, this was just coming off the heels of 9-11. And then you would have like characters like Max and Danny always coming up with this motto like never give up, never give up. Yeah, you know, I definitely really enjoyed some of the multi-parters of the season. I mean, reinforcements from the future was also a pretty great crossover with the Wild Force and the Time Force Rangers and really tying up loose ends to any stories that were left over from Time Force. Um, you had Brancic coming back and um, learning the error of, of his ways so he had to like team with the entire Power Rangers and take on these uh, mute orgs which are like a hybrid of the creatures from the previous season and the creatures of the current season being uh, mutant and org so half mutant half org we also get to see Jen you know ba basically showcasing her badassness like her version of Carter Grayson, but also showing her version of like Laura Croft. So um, yeah, that was all, I thought that was actually pretty, uh, pretty cool and pretty sexy just looking at Jen. But yeah, it was just a really all around great episode. And even the chemistry with Taylor and Eric as well. I mean, that was also really well done. Forever Red was also pretty cool because we got to see all the Red Rangers from the previous seasons up until the current season. So that was also pretty cool, like very ahead of its time because it's like the Expendables before the Expendables was even conceived. So just to see all those 10 Red Rangers teaming up to take on this big threat. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I understand a lot of people wish that it was a two-parter and I very much agree with what those folks were feeling. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the one of the few flaws I had was probably the Princess Shayla character. I don't want to blame entirely. I don't want to like weigh down the entire season based on like one character, but I think there was just some thing about Princess Shayla that I just, as far as like inconsistency is probably the right word to put it. Because like she's kind of portrayed as this damsel and then next thing you know, she could learn like martial arts and self-defense. I mean, watching that uh, two-part episode where Master Org returns, she would always get kidnapped and she wouldn't really figure out a way to, you know, find her way to rescue herself from the clutches of Master Org and his minions. Yeah, some of the acting was also pretty wooden in this season. I mean, I mean, I know Power Rangers isn't really known for its Oscar-winning performance by any stretch, but... It was a lot more apparent with the one acting here in this season. And especially with, you know, with Jindrax. Well, not Jindrax, uh, Toxica, excuse me. Like the kite story arc was also pretty bad. I mean, there was just this whole emphasis on pollution and the fact that kites actually siding with the creatures and how awful like these humans are for not cleaning up their environment and you know, it's like, why didn't you do something from the start? It's like, why don't, like, it, it was just very mind-inducing. I just wish I could find the right words to describe it. But, like, that little kite story arc, I mean, that was just, oh my god. I don't hate Wild Force as most people do, but it definitely had its moments. I definitely really like some of the, uh, like, the villain this season. I thought, eh? He does get pretty underrated, I'll admit. Master Org. I mean, he definitely had his history, and especially going back to um, how it connects to the connection with Cole's parents and why eventually it turns out that Cole's parents actually died. And 
you know, at the time, it's like when I was watching this season that maybe, you know, what if Jindrax and Toxica were Cole's parents all along? But it turns out that wasn't the case. And Cole's parents did perish uh, before he was born or when he was little. It had to do with Dr. Adler being the person that was responsible for killing Cole's parents. And, you know, they were, you know, he used to work with their parents and then he got jealous because the father got with the woman that he loves. So Adler ends up retaliating and he even goes out as far as to murdering them and then even eating the seeds of Master Orc. That was actually a pretty, a pretty underrated villain, I would say. And I don't think he gets a lot of credit. So I, I definitely really like the main villain of this season. I'll force, I'll definitely rank not too high on my list, but I don't hate it as much as other folks do, but well, it definitely had its moments, I would say. We're going to go to Power Rangers Zeo. So Zeo was the first uh, Power Rangers season to go through this massive overhaul because now gone are the Mighty Morphin suits and now they had to gain new powers after uh, the likes of Goldar, Rita, and Zed were involved in destroying their ninja coins. And, you know, the Rangers were turned to children, so they had to retrieve the Zeo crystals and combine them together in order to uh, restore their normal selves and as well as the entire Earth, which was being rotated back in time thanks to Master Vile. The Power Rangers had to gain the new powers. They become the Zeo Rangers. And uh, yeah, it was just a big turning point and a really huge deal that would eventually change the course of Power Rangers forever. I definitely would say I enjoyed this season. I did remember watching this even during its original run. And just to see, you know, the change from the command center over the power chamber, I thought that was actually pretty refreshing and how cramped the command center was. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I like the command center, but and I mean, it's an iconic headquarters from the original series and all, but it was pretty dated. So the command center was pretty cramped. And when they went over to the power chamber, it just feels very spacious that you could just move around without having to worry about lacking any space. So I definitely really liked the design. And you know, you even got to see like the original Mighty Morphin suits that were up on display. Uh, so, But unfortunately, you don't see that once you get to Turbo when they replace them with the color tubes. But yeah, I mean, I definitely really enjoyed the season. And even though there were some things that kind of turned me off, like the, you know, obvious, for obvious reasons, the infamous Dear John letter with Kimberly dumping Tommy and that she was supposedly seeing another guy, which really didn't make any sense because, you know, Kimberly wouldn't really do anything to break up Tommy the way she did. I mean, even if Kimberly did have to break up with Tommy because long distances don't work, but they kind of just handled it in a way where it doesn't really make everyone look completely ridiculous because, you know, he had all his friends, like, reading the letter with him, which is completely unrealistic because you don't want to, like, disturb Tommy and his personal life. I mean, yeah, you're his friend, but, you know, you think that, you know, you would give Tommy some space. I mean, they didn't have to, like, you know, eavesdrop on Tommy and the way they did. So I just kind of wish they kind of handled the breakup scene better. But yeah, I mean, we do get to see a guest appearance from Sarah Brown, who was just coming off the heels of another Saban show with BR Troopers. And this is basically around this time where she was starting to transition over to soap operas. And I think it was not long after this that she would go on to have her success on General Hospital and among various other um, primetime television shows and uh, soap operas that she would end up appearing in. I believe it was called There's No Business Like Snow Business. I did enjoy seeing Jason come back as the Gold Ranger. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I would have loved to have seen Billy as the Gold Ranger, but I mean, it is what it is. And I know this was really around the time behind the scenes that uh, his actor, um, David Yost, was also getting uh, ridiculed for being gay. I mean, it's one of those topics where you're just kind of like, man, I just wish they didn't say all these bad things about him. And that you kind of wish that 
his actor would have stayed. And speaking of Billy, you know, Rangers of Two Worlds, where he got to see the crossover with the Alien Rangers and the Zeo Rangers, kind of paying off some of the stories from the Alien Rangers saga. So the fact that we got to see the core Rangers and the Alien Rangers kind of teaming up side by side, I thought that was pretty cool. I, I would say Zeo was also a, you know, a pretty solid season, even despite some aspects of the season that I didn't like you know they utilized a lot of uh, Sentai footage in this season compared to the previous two seasons where they utilized a lot of uh, American exclusive footage and you know going over to uh, Zio uh, they started to use a lot of Japanese footage and it becomes a lot more apparent in this season I would say Zio I mean it's a childhood of mine it definitely had its moments I'll, I'll, I'll say it that now we get to the next season that uh, have on this list of uh, the first season of MMPR, the season that started all, the season that basically introduced us to the franchise as we know it. It was definitely a very straightforward season. I don't think that the folks that were making this show were very certain that the show was going to last as long as it ended up being 25 plus years later because it was supposed to be a show that was a half hour series to promote some of the toys, some of the merchandise. And that a show like Power Rangers was only going to be around for a certain amount of time. But little did they realize that it would become a pop culture phenomenon. You know, you would have Jason, Trini, Zach, Kimberly, and Billy being our core team of Power Rangers being introduced. You look at back at as an adult now, it's like, yeah, I enjoyed this. But now it's like, what am I watching? It's so, like preschool friendly and it's like all these goody two shoes just always doing the right thing i would say that mmpr does still hold a place in my heart especially with the original lineup with uh the rangers that i mentioned even some of the early half of the season i will say like pre-tommy were pretty goofy i mean there were episodes where billy and kimberly were like switching bodies and there were like episodes where Bulk and Skull would be continually ridiculing the Power Rangers and, you know, coming up with all these plans to kind of woo over some of the female Rangers, like particularly Kimberly and even Trini to an extent. I'm glad that Bulk and Skull did, however, develop as the seasons wore on. So kind of moving away from the run of the mill high school bullies, there would be times where they would just be goofing around and then something happens to them and then everyone around them laughs at them because they did something stupid. They would get pied in the face or they would do something that would piss off uh, some of the supporting characters like Mr. Kaplan or Miss Appleby. But one of the highlights of this season, it's a no-brainer, Green with Evil, which is basically the multi-parter that basically changed the landscape of the franchise forever introducing us to our six ranger being tommy who gets abducted by rita to become the green ranger and uh, leading to a series of episodes where the rangers have to deal with the green ranger and even going as far as destroying the interior of the command center and therefore getting to a point where they were unable to contact zordon because you know tommy ends up destroying like some of the control panels utilize the transportation in order to go over to the command center but there was just some really intense moments in that mini series and uh, we haven't really had that many like multi-parters like that ever since but green with evil was definitely the highlight it was really cool uh fight scenes as well with jason and goldar and uh, you know he wasn't able to use his power morpher because he ends up losing it and then he had to confront goldar in a unmorth fight yeah we also get the introduction of scorpina who would be goldar's wife eclipsing megazord where yeah the, the power rangers would come up short in their megazord fight and then they would be sunken underneath the bottom of the earth and they got got to a point where you know the rangers are kind of like at their toughest challenge because it looks like you know that they're finally beat because up until that point they would always be finding a way to overcome the odds and destroying whatever creature Rita creates or whichever Rita um, sends out. Green with Evil was just really the turning point of this franchise. And I think without that, 
I mean, who knows where the franchise is going to be? Maybe it's not going to be, you know, maybe Power Rangers wouldn't be the phenomenon that it ended up becoming. I mean, I wouldn't even be discussing Power Rangers the way I am now. Um, I mean, it definitely created a legacy. And even despite my love-hate relationship with Tommy, I mean, I mean, he would go on to have his massive success and being like the poster boy for the franchise. So Green with Evil was a highlight. There was also some really good multi-parters, uh, Island of Illusion. Uh, this was a, sort of like a semi-clip show of, of an episode, but also a pretty effective use of it because the Power Rangers were getting sent to this island and they had to kind of follow these sorts you know they had to like literally face their fears otherwise that they would be completely like they would be vanished from existence if they weren't able to overcome their fears i thought that was actually a pretty cool episode green candle which is the episode where tommy's uh green ranger powers were gradually starting to deplete and so the Power Rangers had to find a way to retrieve the candle before Tommy would completely lose his powers. There was just definitely a lot of uh, obstacles that they had to overcome with uh, Jason, especially being the leader of the team at the time, really had to come across like these sorts of situations where it was a pretty interesting uh, dialogue with Zack because, you know, even at that point, you know, in the original Sentai footage being Zoo Ranger because Tommy's counterpart dies and they kind of got to a situation where Tommy's on the brink of death and he's having a hard time struggling to fight off against this creature when he was piloting the dragon sword. So, you know, Jason had to come across this situation. Is it worth retrieving the green candle at the expense of risking uh, Tommy's life? And even also where Tommy asked Kimberly Allen on a date because they also teased a relationship between the two since they introduced the character doomsday which was supposed to be the final episode of the season and little we realized that it was supposed to be the fi a finale of the of the series as a whole low car being like this um very menacing villain i i think low car gets kind of overlooked uh nowadays because now like people say lord zed's kind of menacing but i mean i still think he is but uh, i think a lot of people forget that low car was also a pretty uh, pretty intimidating villain. And even watching as an adult, I mean, I get creeped out, like seeing his face pop out. And then even unleashing the Cyclopsis monster to be a challenge against the Power Rangers. But I don't know when it's all said and done. I mean, season one definitely really uh, introduced me and as well as many viewers to the franchise. You know, and I definitely really have a soft spot for MMPR, even if it's like a love-hate relationship, because I know MMPR gets all this publicity because that's the only season that the general public knows. I mean, most folks don't even give a crap about the other Power Rangers seasons. Seeing this formula being rinse and repeat, even during the Neo Saban era with Samurai and Megaforce and, you know, even Ninja Steels. And as much as I like Dino Charge, even that season was trying so hard to kind of kept recapture that MMPR magic with that with their share of like campiness. There's no denying just how much of an impact that the the original Power Rangers was, especially season one with its original core lineup of Jason, Trini, Zack, Kimberly and Billy, and you know, and eventually Tommy. All right, so moving along with our rankings list I have on here is another Power Rangers season from Mighty Morphin, and that happens to be from season three. Now, season three, to me, in my opinion, is really at the point where Power Rangers was slowly starting to become more serious. Now, what I mean by serious is that going into season three, we also have the four part episode Ninja Quest with the debuting of Rita Rivalto, who happens to be revealed to be Rita's brother. So he makes his presence known and he confronts with the power rangers for the first time this leads into a giant megazord battle between him and the thunder megazords so along the way there it turns out that there was actually a power grid overload and the power rangers are struggling to uh thwart off rito because of how immensely strong he is and Tommy and the rest of the crew had to utilize the Thunder Megazord and 
really using up all as many energy or as much energy as they possibly can. And so this kind of got to a point where the power grid was starting to overload and thus the Megazord really can handle all that power. And we saw the explosion of um, the destruction of the Megazords, I should say. And, uh, you know, the Power Rangers escaped from their Megazord pods. And it turns out that not only were the Megazords destroyed, but also their power coins were deemed useless. And so uh, the Power Rangers were unable to morph. Their, their Megazords were destroyed. And just the reaction from all of our heroes, and especially Kimberly, really sold that moment as far as the drama that unfolds the instant that the Megazords were being destroyed. So I, at the time, I mean, just watching that, I mean, yeah, we've had a couple of Power Ranger moments up in that point where they were at a point where they're at their most vulnerable. And in this case, with part one of Ninja Quest, it was no exception. So what they had to do, especially, is that they find this wise sage named Ninjor, and they had to go find his location in order to garner the power of Ninjetti, or in other terms, because season three heavily emphasized on the ninja aspect or the motif, I should say. They would eventually garner new powers with the ninja powers. So it's basically a retelling of the 1995 Power Rangers movie. And the 95 movie had just came out not too long prior to this. But the thing with the 95 movie is that it has no connection to the regular TV series. So this was basically a retelling of the... Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie, but definitely, but with an entirely different new mentor, as opposed to Dalcia, we also get to, to see the debut of Ninjor. So season three utilized Sentai footage from a more recent Sentai season with Kaku Ranger. And that season also was more emphasized on the art of ninja. So... Yeah, I mean, this was really at a point where the Power Rangers were really at their most... Like, it started to get a lot more serialized to an extent. And by this point, Rita and Zed also joined forces. Now, even then going back to Season 2, there was an initial conflict between Rita and Zed, where Zed uh, sent Rita inside the dumpster and basically banishing her from outer space. By the time you got to the later half of the season, Rita returns. She concocts this love potion, causing Zed to fall in love with her. And thus, Zed started to kind of tone down some of, the, some of the more sinister side to his character. And he really started to kind of lighten up and started becoming a lot more of the life of the party and someone that's kind of, you know, very cheerful and basically the kind of mannerism that Rita has been known for having. So, yeah, I mean, this was really at a point where Zed started to get neutered to an extent and then much to the outcry of many Power Ranger fans over the years. But the more I start to think about it, because I was initially against the idea of Zed being uh, a comic relief. And, you know, I definitely could see why some people feel that way. But the more I start to think about it, you know, going into season three, I kind of feel that the idea of Zed and Rita joining forces really paid off in the long run. And even it shows throughout most of season three when their partnership it seemed like they were getting the job done pretty well and it got to it got really really close to when they were uh just a step away from defeating the power rangers and ninja quest i mean granted they kind of came close to that but you know and then the power rangers started to gain new powers after their original dino coins were damaged beyond repair so not all hope was lost when the rangers received their ninja powers 
So, uh, yeah, I mean, Ninja Quest, I mean, just, uh, definitely, in my opinion, was a very strong season opener. And I know some folks might be thinking, is like, wait a minute. Wasn't there an episode before Ninja Quest that opened up season three? And you wouldn't be wrong, actually. As a matter of fact, uh, Friend in Need was a three-part episode that came on uh, right before Ninja Quest to open up season three. Because this was also uh, around the time when they were going to premiere a new series, that being Masked Rider, being the first and only spin-off series of Power Rangers that we had to date. So, A Friend in Need, I don't necessarily have any nostalgic memories of, because I don't necessarily have any, like, particular memories when I originally watched this episode when it aired. Like, this episode didn't get aired a whole lot. It might have aired on Fox Kids here and there, but I don't necessarily remember seeing reruns of it by the time they started showing reruns on, like, ABC Family or Toon Disney at the time, because often at times when they would show some of the older Power Ranger episodes, nine times out of ten, they would always skip a friend in need for some reason. I never understood why. Uh, it wasn't until many years later when I started discovering this episode on YouTube and watching it in its entirety for the first time. And I know people have their kind of opinions on the Masked Rider series. It was very much like sort of a half-action adventure, but also having like the spirit of a traditional multi-camera sitcom. Like it, it tried to be like everything kind of meshed into like one series. Like Mass Rider was kind of like combining the elements of Power Rangers, Superman, because Dex came from another planet being Edenoi. So he gets shipped down to planet Earth, much like when Clark Kent got sent over from Krypton to planet Earth as well. You know, it just didn't really pan out the way it did, and the show only lasted for about maybe a year and a half. Mass Rider is an entirely different uh, topic discussion for another day, but in this episode, I thought he was pretty decent for the role that he was given, and it really kind of uh, used as a way to kind of uh, introduce us to the character, and as well as using that as a like I said, a backdoor pilot for his own series. So yeah, so the Power Rangers had to go to Planet Edenoi. They had to figure out what was going on. And then they meet up with Dex, who at the time believed that the Power Rangers were their enemies, that they were being sent by a villain named Count Dragon. So uh, yeah, so there was definitely some connections to Power Rangers overall. And, you know, even Alpha kind of had his connections to the plan Enoi and where he used to live in. Um, yeah, so they were really, like, initially it seemed like they were really trying to use this as a way to connect Masked Rider with Power Rangers. But then by this point, like, Power Rangers' popularity was gradually dwindling. So by the time the Masked Rider series came out, like, any ties to Power Rangers that they had were all completely non-existent. In retrospect, it's like, what was the point of this? This was like before expanded universes were even a thing. I mean, it was it's not like what you see now with like the Marvel Cinematic Universe where you have all these superheroes from different uh, series all like crossover and they are all like intertwined. So it's not in that sense because I know Saban also had other series that were airing during this time. Not just Masked Rider, but also like VR Troopers and a little later on with shows like Beetleborgs and Mystic Knights of Turn and Oak. Masked Rider was actually the only true uh, spinoff to Power Rangers because even shows like VR Troopers and Beetleborgs were a completely different thing. Like they weren't connected to the Power Ranger series whatsoever. That experiment backfired and we haven't really had another spin-off attempt of Power Rangers ever since. I mean, A Friend of Need, I mean, there are better multi-parters, I'll be honest. There were some gripes I think most folks had, like Kimberly being left all alone on Earth to protect uh, the planet from Lord Zed and Rita. And the thing was, is that she ended up getting sick. And, you know, she had to kind of fight her own battles while the rest of the other Power Rangers were on Edenoi. So I think I would have been better off if they had just divided the Power Rangers 
and have like three rangers protect Earth and three rangers protect planet Edenoid. But, you know, a friend in need when it's all said and done. I mean, it definitely did its job. I, I just kind of really wish that they continue to connect Mass Rider with Power Rangers and use that as a way to, you know, expand on the Power Rangers mythology. And I really feel that they definitely missed an opportunity by having Mass Rider stand out by focusing more on the events that go on throughout Planet Edenoi. So I thought that would have been a, a unique way of setting itself apart from Power Rangers, where the Rangers are a group of civilians that are defending the planet Earth. It's like, why can't we have someone like Dex defend his own planet? Now, I know I've kind of rambled on and on about Masked Rider, so I'm going to move on to the next topic of Season 3 that was occurring. And this was actually around the time where uh, Kimberly's actress Amy Jo Johnson was also expressing interest in leaving the series. We also, in turn, get the introduction of Catherine. Now, Catherine, when she was introduced, she would be... Rita's servant, and she would have this ability to literally transform herself into a cat. Kimberly and, and Aisha discover a cat. They decide to name the cat PC, which stood for part cat. And little would they realize that the part cat that they had was actually Catherine all along. I, I definitely really like the introduction of cat. I mean, it, it definitely set apart from uh, Green with Evil when Rita abducted Tommy in order to become her slave and the Green Ranger. But here, it's like Kat was already evil from the start. How exactly did she become evil? Well, we had to turn in to the next several episodes. Changing of the Zords, you know, this was really where um, Catherine steals Kimberly's power coin. And Kimberly starts getting really exhausted. There was actually a really cool scene where Lord Zed infiltrates the command center which was actually very shocking at the time because very rarely would you see a villain come into the rangers headquarters the way they did and just the moment alone during that multi-parter it was definitely very shocking and just to see the rangers reactions seeing lord zed and you know they had to basically make an offer so tommy goes into cavern that was underneath Rita's palace and rescuing Kimberly in the process which led to a little unique fight scene between Tommy and Zed so there was actually some pretty unique stuff because we actually get to see a Power Ranger fight off with Lord Zed and Zed we never really got to see him in like hand-to-hand -hand combat so this was also a very rare and unique moment from that miniseries and also the uh the Falcon Zord which was also used to uh, be piloted by Tommy and Kimberly. So that Zord gets taken away. Tommy does rescue Kimberly. And the episode, and basically the story arc continues from there, which uh, culminates into the three part episode, which would be a different shade of pink. So Kimberly gets an offer to join the Pan Global Games. And so Kimberly's kind of working her butt off. This gets to a point where she completely falls unconscious. And so she gets taken to the hospital. So the Power Rangers have to basically kind of deal with the situation. And Catherine's kind of feeling very insecure about herself because of what she's done. And, you know, the fact that she was being served as Rita's apprentice. I thought this was really well done. And this was actually Kimberly's uh, last hurrah. I guess my only minor nitpick I have to make mention of is the fact that the way that Kimberly just went out as a Power Ranger kind of ends on a whimper. And, you know, when Kimberly's helping out with the Power Rangers, she ends up falling unconscious. And, you know, and she's kind of at her most vulnerable. So she couldn't have that one last hurrah. But at the same time, I can understand where they were going with is that they're introducing this new character. They want to kind of just have her kind of shine more because she's going to go on to become a Power Ranger. So Kat basically undoes her bad deeds. She ends up um, freeing herself from the jail cell when she gets kidnapped. And she successfully retrieves the power coin that she stole from Kimberly, only for Kimberly to pass the torch over the cat 
by the end of a different shade of pink and thus making her to be the pink Power Ranger. Definitely really enjoyed a uh, different shade of pink and definitely really enjoyed the evil cat mini arc. And you could really tell that her actress, Captain Southern, really had a blast playing kind of like this more, like this evil bitch that has this sort of jealousy over Kimberly because she has a thing for Tommy and Kimberly's already in a relationship with Tommy. Another one of the examples where the stakes were also being raised because now the Power Rangers are also kind of getting thrown in challenge after challenge after challenge by Rita and Zed. But that doesn't stop there because we get the introduction of Master Vile. And so he ends up kidnapping Ninjor and this kind of leads into a pretty intense... Megazord fight with the Ninja Zord versus the Blue Gobbler, which is a creature that Master Vile ends up deploying. Now, it does kind of go downhill towards the end of the season when they introduce us to the Alien Rangers. Not that I'm saying the Alien Rangers were bad, but that was around the time when the Power Rangers were turned into kids when Master Vile comes up with an idea to use the Orb of Doom in order to turn back time. Basically, a bit of a callback also in Rangers in Reverse where Lord Zed did a similar thing with the Rock of Time. The same thing kind of happens here, only that this was Master Vile's doing. So uh, I did like a little bit of that callback, but I can understand why some folks didn't like that episode. And the Power Rangers just kind of choosing to kind of throw in the towel as opposed to doing everything that they can to destroy the Orb of Doom. And the Alien Ranger story arc I wasn't too fascinated on. And we it, was, it wasn't really so much that we didn't really get... Uh, like, I, I don't necessarily have anything against the Alien Rangers, but they kind of felt very secondary despite being the interim Power Rangers for that miniseries. But... I mean, this was also a season that was used to kind of bridge the gap from Mighty Morphin over to Zeo. Because when the Power Rangers were turned to kids, they were unable to use their uh, ninja coins. And then at some point, their coins get destroyed. So then they had to seek out the Zeo crystals that were scattered all across the globe. They had already did that during Master Vile and the Metallic Armor, where we get the first mention of the Zeo crystal. So it seemed like they knew, like, in advance that they were going to move on to the next series. And little would we realize that would come at the expense of them sacrificing the original Power Rangers in order to gain an entirely new set of costumes. And just a whole overall rebranding of the franchise that would just change it forever. I think also another reason I think why some folks were turned off was... Like, it was really short, the more I realized that Mighty, like season three of Mighty Morphin was like the shortest out of the three seasons. Looking back, I don't think it is as bad as people make it out to be. I think this was really where things started getting heated up. I think that this was really a season that started to become a lot more arc-driven. And for all the years that, you know, Mighty Morphin's always been criticized for being like this television series where like not much happens and every episode is like more or less the same but in season three we get to see like a lot of multi-part episodes and a lot of episodes that are kind of at a point where the rangers are facing their most toughest challenge so i thought this was actually very refreshing definitely really enjoyed season three overall and then we get to the next power ranger season that being lost galaxy this was actually a follow-up to another uh, space-driven Power Rangers season with Power Rangers in Space because Lost Galaxy, we get to kind of expand on the mythology of Power Rangers and showing that there's more life outside of planet Earth. And to date, this is also the first and only Power Rangers season that has taken place outside of Earth. And so after the events from Countdown to Destruction, we get an entirely new cast of Power Rangers which would be a formula that still goes on to this very day with a new cast, new ranger powers, new zords, basically new everything. And so we get all these five young adults and they are on board in this ship called Terra Venture. And they would go on throughout 
outer space to, in search for a new world. The Power Rangers visit Marinoi. You know, they eventually become the Power Rangers. Basically a callback to, uh, based on loosely on the mythology of Sword and Stone or Excalibur. So I definitely like some of the like the sci-fi fantasy elements of this season. It's very interesting because the footage that they used for Lost Galaxy being Giga Man emphasized on uh, Mother Nature and everything around it. But the thing with Lost Galaxy is that it didn't like with Lost Galaxy, a lot of it was basically taking place outside of Earth and you know and Giga Man wasn't a space opera much unlike Lost Galaxy. You know, you could tell it was one of the most expensively produced Power Ranger seasons to date. And I really love the design of Terra Venture, and it definitely really holds up 20 years later after Lost Galaxy had originally aired. And I remember watching this season like yesterday and definitely had a lot of fond memories watching it. You know, Leo, I thought he was a very solid Red Ranger, and originally his brother Mike was going to be the Red Ranger, but eventually he fell underneath a crevice and at the time we all thought that he was dead and that was actually quite a shocker you know because we never really see a lot of uh, Power Ranger seasons at the point where uh, like a certain main character sacrifices themselves and that would actually be a common theme that you would see throughout Lost Galaxy. Mike hands his Quasar Saber to Leo and Leo would go on to become the Red Ranger. Mike would return towards the tail end of the first half of Lost Galaxy, when it turns out by that point that the Magda Defender managed to use Mike's spirit in order to let him live. And I definitely really liked how they introduced us to the Magda Defender, because he's he was kind of the first anti-hero of the franchise, the more I start to think about it. And he kind of has that mysterious presence about him, even though he could be a pretty much of a jerk because, you know, like he's, a, you know, he's a warrior that fights his own battles. He used to have a son named Zika who gets killed and the Magna Defender was seeking revenge, but that backfired. And now he's back again to retaliate after uh, losing his son. So he's going to go out and avenge the villains that were involved that were responsible for killing Zika. And to see a child getting killed was also another shocking moment in Power Rangers history. I definitely enjoyed the Magna Defender story arc. And we also get the introduction of Lost, uh, the Lights of Orion. I know some folks have questions about that. Exactly how did the Lights of Orion just magically or randomly arrived on Terra Venture to begin with? So I, I know some folks do have some issues with the way that they were handling the Lights of Orion. But other than that, I definitely think that the Magda Defender story arc was really well done. And eventually the Magda Defender would pass the torch over to Mike and he would become the Magda Defender even despite uh, not being the Red Ranger earlier on in the season. But uh, we do get the best of both worlds where Leo and Mike get to fight alongside one another and I kind of wish that Mike kind of got utilized a lot better because he was just kind of there to help out the Rangers. But we never really kind of get to see more of him. The Space Lost Galaxy crossover, you know, the Psycho Rangers make their return. And the Lost Galaxy Rangers team up with the Space Rangers, which is definitely really cool. And this was also the first uh, season which started the tradition of past Power Rangers seasons crossing over with the current season of Power Ranger teams. So I thought that was also really unique and it's something that's definitely been missing with the franchise for quite a long time. I wish that they brought this concept back, but I can understand a lot of that has to do with uh, cost cutting measures now that they're shooting Power Rangers in New Zealand. So it would be too expensive to hire some of the former Power Ranger actors to make a return uh, since New Zealand and the U.S. are like overseas and it takes a, quite a long time for actors to travel from one country to the other. This was actually during this time where Kendrick's actress, Valerie Vernon, 
was getting diagnosed due to the leukemia. And some of the episodes leading into that episode, it starts becoming more apparent where you don't really see her a lot. And she would get replaced by like a stunt actress. So you wouldn't even know that she got replaced by a certain stunt double that resembles Valerie Vernon. Around the time that we got to the crossover, so they eventually wrote off Kendrick's by sacrificing herself for Cassie because she was getting attacked by Psycho Pink and they were uh, having a difficult time dealing with the sole survivor of the Psycho Rangers. And so uh, Kendrick's tried to uh, destroy the Savage Sword that was used to channel some of the energy for Psycho Pink to become stronger. So Kendrick's makes the ultimate sacrifice. Now I'm unsure exactly like as far as the idea of having to kill off uh, Kendrick's, especially given that her actress is also diagnosed with leukemia and could have potentially passed away in real life. So I don't know if this could have been done, had this, this been done in a way where her actress ended up dying like her character did. I mean, which would be completely insane just even thinking about that, but... Thankfully, uh, Valerie managed to survive and managed to fight off uh, leukemia. You know, I wonder what the writers were thinking going into this, knowing that her actress was kind of undergoing treatment and just the idea of her sacrificing herself. So I wonder what the process was like and even just thinking about it. Because, you know, you would think that her actress could have felt uncomfortable with the idea of having to have her character just go out in the blaze of glory. In terms of the scene, for what it was, it was handled really well. Now, as far as the how it turned out in the long run, that's pretty questionable because she does eventually uh, get revived at the end of Journey's End, like out of nowhere. But uh, at the same time, I could understand where they were going with. Even in story-wise sense, it didn't make any sense. But she just magically comes back at the end. But even if they were going to bring her back, I wish they could have done it in a way where, like, maybe the Power Rangers had this sort of, like, wishing coin that they wish that there were someone that they could bring back. So, like, kind of hinting on the possibility or the idea of reviving Kentrix back from the dead. I'm just definitely glad uh, that Valerie Vernon did manage to fight off of this. I, I definitely thought that this was uh, a pretty pivotal moment in not just for Lost Galaxy, but for the entire Power Rangers franchise in general. As far as Cassie's concerned, because I know her actress, uh, Patricia Jolly, was also uh, considering to replace uh, Valerie Vernon in order to become the Pink Power Ranger. There was like a bit of a money dispute that happened that prevented her from going forth with her as... Kendrick's successor and then she would get replaced by Carone who previ was previously in Power Rangers space as Astronema so she would get, uh, take over Kendrick's to become the Pink Ranger until the remainder of the series. I definitely really enjoyed Carone's redemption as well and just going from villain to a Power Rangers is something that we haven't really seen with any character ever since so that kind of really makes her stand out and her kind of phase of, you know, going from being evil and trying to, you know, redeem herself in order to, you know, just undo some of the sins that she committed. Like, I definitely really like Corone's presence in the season. So there you go at that. I'm going to go over and, well, as far as the villains, before I end this uh, discussion on Lost Galaxy. So... Before this, uh, I also want to talk about some of the villains, you know, Trakina, because originally Trakina was the daughter of Scorpius, who was the original main villain in the early half of Lost Galaxy. And Trakina was just basically, when we first see her, she was basically in the background and she would occasionally serve as a servant in order to perform her father's duty you know she didn't really have the kind of uh fighting background that she would eventually have as the season rolls along uh scorpius eventually gets killed but by that point scorpius sends trakina to planet onyx where she meets up with villamax and villamax 
trains with Trakina in a very rocky style of way. And so she gets better and better and better and better and better. And so Trakina uh, befriends Villamax and becomes one of Trakina's servants once uh, Scorpius was killed. So Trakina would be promoted as heir to the throne, hence the name of the episode title in the season. I definitely really liked uh, Trakina as a villain and just to see kind of like the growth that she had to go through. And even Villamax, because, you know, even though Villamax was a villain, it really showed like during Journey's End where Villamax uh, was saving this girl, like this little girl, and then Trakina starts belittling Villamax for having any sort of compassion. And so she ends up turning on her own mentor and even destroying him. So, oh, it just really showed just how a menacing villain that Trakina was. And it kind of really showed just how sympathetic Villamax was. But at the time, it was also something that was very uh, surprising, especially in that episode, because, you know, Journey's End was just one of the more, like, expensive um, episodes that they produced. And just how shocking it was at the time, because bear in mind, this was like before 9-11 even occurred. And the fact that they were able to get away with all the violence on a Saturday morning was also something that was very uh, significant. Like even watching that as a kid and even to this day as an adult, it's one of those episodes that really holds up very well, even 20 years later. And um, I definitely rank this up with Countdown to Destruction as one of my all-time favorite uh, season finales to a Power Rangers season. You know, there was it was definitely one of my favorite uh, periods of Power Rangers, like that period from like Space to Wild Force. A great stretch of season finales that we've had, and I guess you could t count Turbo as well. But you know, but I think that stretch from Turbo to Wild Force, as a matter of fact, I would say that this would really, in my opinion, had some really great season finales. Journey's End was no exception. So those are basically my thoughts of Lost Galaxy. I know I've kind of rambled on and on about it, but it kind of goes to show just how what an amazing season that it is. So then we get to my next list in Power Rangers as far as all the series uh, throughout the course of the Saban era. And this next season on my list happens to be from the second season of Mighty Morphin. We get the introduction of Lord Zed. Zed makes his presence known. And, you know, he comes off, you know, very cold and sinister when he debuts, which is a stark contrast from the lighthearted goofiness that Rita had in season one. At the time, I mean, it really scared a lot of ch uh, children as far as the Target demo is concerned when it came to the viewers that were watching Power Rangers at the time. Because, you know, we never seen like a live action villain on a TV series for kids that was as menacing as Lord Zed. I, I definitely really like just the, you know, just the uh, appearance of him, but especially his character and just his mannerism. Like he'll do whatever it takes to destroy the Power Rangers. So I was like so enamored by it. The first half of season two, I would say was really at its, really Mighty Morphin at its strongest. Cause this was, Obviously, that the original team was still carry over into the season two. And, you know, and Tommy's still having to kind of deal with uh, his temporary Green Ranger powers. Because, bear in mind, by this point, the Green Candle was withered away. So, you know, Tommy could no longer morph into the Green Ranger on a regular basis. But when... Uh, Zordon would be able to transfer some of his energy to Tommy in order to morph into the Green Ranger. And, you know, the Power Rangers, the 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 original five, had to turn in their power coins to Goldar when their parents were getting kidnapped. And in order for them to uh, rescue their parents, it also had to come with the price. And so the Power Rangers were kind of put in the situation where they had to uh, turn over their power coins to... Uh, Goldar getting back to Tommy so he had to rely on Zordon in order to continue his status as a Power Ranger and so the Green Ranger powers were only temporary and it becomes like kind of like a recurring theme over the course of these episodes where it seemed like it's only a matter of time before he would eventually lose the powers and uh 
you know, and then we get to Green No More, where his powers were also starting to become a lot more apparent. He gets sent into an unknown dimension with Goldar. So bring, basically hearkening back to Green with Evil with Jason and Goldar, but unlike when they were fighting in a dark dimension. So Tommy and Goldar were fighting in the middle of outskirts of nowhere. And so there was actually a really cool fight scene with uh, Jason David Frank as Tommy. So I thought that was really, really well done. And um, and he also gets this sort of a uh, message from the future, from the future Tommy, about what was going to happen. Yeah, so that was really the last hurrah for the Green Ranger on a regular basis. So the next time we do see the Green Ranger, it would be in um, the Return of the Green Ranger miniseries where we get to see two Tommies, the White Ranger, the Green Ranger, fighting against one another and then fighting alongside one another. And then he would come back again in Dino Thunder with Fighting Spirit and even in uh, Legendary Battle with Power Rangers Super Mega Force. If Jason, Trini, and Zack hadn't left the series, I honestly think that Season 3 would have undoubtedly be the best uh, Power Rangers season. Maybe like top 5. I think this is really hard to rank because it's like when Season 2 premiered, it just starts off with a bang and you know we still had the original team coming into the season and then you know and then the actors were uh leaving the series when they were kind of having a hard time dealing with the pay dispute that they were getting because by this point power rangers was like a pop culture phenomenon and the fact that the likes of austin st john Twee Trang and Walter Jones weren't getting uh, enough money, so, uh, or at least weren't getting like a profit or at least getting a pay raise. That also kind of raised tensions between the actors and the people behind the scenes. They chose to leave the series, and so they got replaced by three new actors with uh, Steve Cardenas. Johnny Young Bosch and Karen Ashley to portray the roles of Rocky, Adam, and Aisha. So they would go on to become their successors. I know the later half of, of the season two episodes were kind of very hit and miss because there were also a couple multi-part episodes that were just kind of like, what was the whole point of this? Like storybook rangers where half the Power Rangers get sent to this magical fairy tale that Kimberly used to read as a child. And they have to, like, find their way out of the story. You know, Rocky just wants to have fun, where Rocky is, like, a video game addict. And, like, there was, like, this villain that uh, puts a spell on Rocky, and he's having too much fun. And he's putting uh, playtime over work, because, you know, being that he's a high school student. So, you know, he wasn't doing his assignments, and, um, and then he's acting all around a goofball. There were some good gems. I mean, I'm not saying season two was completely bad. There's definitely some good stuff that I mentioned, like, you know, just the first half of the season, uh, Return of the Green Ranger was cool. I might as well just mention about Tommy losing the Green Ranger powers in order to become the White Ranger. So, um, yeah, so White Light, the two-part episode. So that was uh, a pretty uh, infamous episode because for the obvious reasons that Tommy would go on to become the White Ranger. And the way that he just descended like he was Jesus Christ. So that was a little over the top. And this was also during that time where Tommy would be promoted as leader of the Power Rangers. Because I think that was also a thing that was phoned in as a result of Austin St. John leaving the series. So um, so I, I think that Jason would have still been the leader. Had there not been a falling out, maybe have some occasions where Tommy would be the leader, maybe like a second command, like he could have been. I think Zack was a second command. But yeah, I, I think that if things didn't go all haywired the way it did, I honestly think that, you know, that Jason would have still been the leader of the pack through and through. And perhaps on occasions that Tommy would take over as leader whenever Jason wasn't present. Yeah, I definitely really enjoyed the second season of Mighty Morphin. Now we're going over to the last two seasons of the Saban era and it's a toss up between Space and Time Force. 
And this was definitely a really hard call. I'll be honest. This is definitely a really hard call. So if I had to pick... I'm going to go with Time Force at number two. I know that might be a controversial pick, but uh, I love Time Force as much as the next guy. And Time Force, to me, really shows just what, you know, that we never thought that Power Rangers could be. And for all the years that Power Rangers was kind of like this silly, nonsensical kid show about these group of civilians being chosen by this wise sage to defend their own planet from the likes of some outside forces from another planet far away. The fact that we get the time force is that we kind of deal with a lot of interesting themes throughout that season, like the idea of villains being prejudiced based on their looks and how they just because they look different doesn't mean that they're automatically evil. So there is definitely a, like one of the many examples of those tropes. And I definitely really enjoyed the, uh, the the concept of the idea of Power Rangers traveling through time. You know, you have the likes of Jen, Trip, Lucas, and Katie that came from the future. And their leader at the time being Alex. So Alex was basically the only Power Ranger that we saw when we first see uh, the first four civilians that would go on to become Power Rangers. So at some point, Alex gets destroyed by Rancic, or killed to be exact. And this was also one of the few times that in Power Rangers history that there was a character that mentions death. Because a lot of the times they would say, oh, this character got destroyed. This kind of gets to a point where Rancic travels back in time to alter history. So Jen and the rest of the crew uh, go inside this spaceship pod that would send them back in time to 2001 they meet up with a spoiled rich kid named Wes and so he would eventually go on to become a Power Ranger when it turns out that his DNA biologically resembles that of Alex Wes does become the Red Ranger while Jen also um, this is also very interesting because this was also the first Power Ranger season that did not have a Red Ranger as the leader, I was going to say. Now, granted, we did have that with Tommy when he gets promoted to White Ranger and even um, the White Alien Ranger as well. I can't even remember her name. As far as Jen, because she was the Pink Ranger, so she kind of gets a chance to lead the team based on her experience and her motivation to get back at Rancic for killing her fiancé that she was planning to marry. You know, we also get the debut of the Sixth Ranger being Eric, the Quantum Ranger. So that was also something that could have been interesting if we kind of got uh, a set of Quantum Rangers with different color designations. So um, that was something that could have happened, but it never did. And there was, even though there was a moment in uh, Clash for Control, where this was at a point where Wes's father discovered that his son was a Power Ranger... So he makes an offer that to the four of the other Power Rangers that having the Power Rangers uh, join Biolab in order to fight alongside the Silver Guardians. So that was also something that was up for consideration. But at the end of the day, that turns out that wasn't the case. And they decide to kind of keep doing their own thing and sticking with Wes. The second half of Time Force, we also get the return of Alex. And so he goes back in time to supposedly undo the wrongings that uh, that his team had done in the episodes where Alex was supposedly dead. But it was hinted a few times that there was like a mysterious person that was surveying all the action that was unfolding uh, in 2001 and little we realized that that would turn out to be Alex all along I think at some point because I know some folks have said time and time again exactly how Alex managed to survive throughout all those throughout this whole time I think had to do with the way that the Power Rangers were basically doing everything in the power to uh, prevent uh, Rancic and his creatures from 
altering history and destroying Silver Hills. So I think their presence also kind of factors into the course of time being altered. This was also during that time where Alex informs West that his father would get injured thanks to Rancic. So he gets rushed to the hospital and it gets to a point where Alex informs West of the unfortunate news that his father would tragically pass away. That was just completely mind blown just hearing that and you know it's even more ironic now because his actor like the actor that plays uh mr collins has unfortunately passed away a couple years after that episode aired which is definitely which is quite sad just even thinking about that but at the time just watching that as a viewer i'm like holy shit how are they gonna get out of this and now that wes gets outed as a power ranger Alex resumes his duty as Red Ranger and Wes being forced to uh, take over his father's company. So there was a theme that goes on is that, you know, no matter what you do, you can't change your destiny, which is also a common theme throughout that mini saga that they had. And it turns out that you could change your destiny when Wes uh, takes a stand and basically helps out the Power Rangers and so, uh, yeah, all's well as ends well. You know, and the way that Alex did come off as a jerk throughout that mini saga. So that was also kind of like, you know, it's like, what happened to him? It's like, what made him act the way he is? Like, you know, you could really tell that I think there was this, a bit of a jealousy with uh, Alex and his connections to the Power Rangers. Because, like, all this time, Alex has been MIA or he's not in condition to be a Power Ranger. So now the rest of his um, teammates are surpassing him. And, you know, Alex is just kind of, you know, showing a bit of uh, signs of envy. I definitely really enjoy Time Force in general. And even uh, the end of time also, where the Time Force Rangers, excluding Wes, getting sent back to the future and to the point where Wes would eventually... Uh, sacrifice himself in order to save the city um and as far as eric's concerned because his japanese counterpart eventually dies in time ranger but because of fox having more of a issue when it comes to characters dying in a children's show much like what they had with the idea of tommy uh, meeting his untimely death in Mighty Morphin had that happened. So in this case with Eric, he was they, they were originally going to kill him off, but uh, the influence that Fox executives had on the show, so unfortunately they weren't doing it. And the more I start to think of it, I think it was all for the better to see like Eric actually survive. It would have been tragic if he did die, but um, I'm so relieved that Eric did survive. Otherwise, he wouldn't be... Uh, teaming up with Wes and patching up their endless rivalry that they had throughout the season. Definitely really enjoyed Time Force from top to bottom. One of the many Power Rangers seasons where I could just watch over and over and over and over, over again. Definitely one of my favorite seasons. And I know it's really hard for me to kind of rank this like at number two when you would think that this would have been the top of my list. And for those that are wondering what the number one list is going to be, I think it'd be pretty much of a no-brainer, really. And that happens to be Power Rangers in Space. Space really was a change gamer for Power Rangers in general. And we kind of get to see, with Power Rangers in Space, more of a concrete story arc. Because now with Chase into Space... The Turbo Rangers were informed that Zora had been held under captivity by Dark Spectre. So they had to chase into space once their headquarters was destroyed. And they eventually lose their Ranger powers. So they had to go to outer space. And they meet up with a character named Andros. Which is a very interesting scenario with Andros. Because... Unlike many Power Rangers up until that point, we never really got to see kind of like that Power Ranger that just kind of 
Like they aren't like they're always like together. They're always on good terms, and you know they're always besties forever. But here it's like in space when we get to see Andros. This is a guy that basically fights his own battles, and you know he definitely when he first was introduced. I mean he did come across as a jerk. That he did came across very arrogant. This was also a theme that goes on throughout the season opener from out of nowhere. So Andros does do a good deed helping out the Power Rangers because the Power Rangers, you know, they can't morph. They, you know, their powers were destroyed. Like I said, they meet up with Andros. They try to reason with him and why he's acting very selfish. The fact that he's just basically a loner. Uh, but we do get a little more into his character as the season rolls along when it turns out that he used to have a friend named Zane, who he fought alongside with as the Silver Ranger. And at some point, Zane gets severely injured on the brink of death. So Andros uh, encases Zane in uh, suspended animation. Like he was stuck in a coma. So he had to kind of put him in a cryogenic state until he recovers. So uh, just to kind of explain how Andros got to be the character that he ended up being when we first see him, it definitely explains. Andros originally sends the four rangers back to planet Earth, but it was only a matter of time before Astronema meets up with the powerless rangers at this point, and they're fighting off the foot soldiers of that season. I think they were called the Quantrons. I'm pretty sure they were called the Quantrons. And then Andros came back, he turns the ship around using the Astro Morphers. They were able to morph into the Power Rangers once again. And so that was a really strong way to open up that season. We get to kind of see a little more with the villains also with Astronema and learning about what her past really was because she really has no memory of what her life was like before becoming the princess that she ended up becoming. So... Andros also had his own motivation because he's also in search of his sister who was kidnapped and we aren't sure exactly what had happened ever since. And turns out that Dorkonda was the villain that was involved brainwashing her into becoming Astronema. I thought that was definitely really well done. And also with the search for Zordon was also another uh, side story that was going on. So with space, you just had all these stories just kind of intertwine into this one season and you also had the villains becoming more multi-layered because before that it's all these villains are all oh we gotta we gotta destroy the power rangers and we're gonna take over the world but when you got to space it's like they have their own kind of like motivation not all the villains are evil at least that's not how they're you know despite how they look and that was also a theme that they had with one episode, Wasp with the Heart, where uh, Cassie befriends this little creature, or supposedly a little creature, as opposed to the traditional, I'm going to destroy you. But yeah, that was also a very uh, interesting concept that hadn't been seen in Power Rangers before. And that would eventually be reused once again in Time Force, where they did a little similar episode with Trip. There's just really a lot of stuff that you could really enjoy. It definitely really expanded on the mythology of the franchise and to show that there is more life outside of Earth, which was shown in Mighty Morphin with Edenoi, but that eventually doesn't get brought up again. Uh, but here with space, we get to see a little more of that. And I think that was kind of the inspiration that, as to what led into the following season with Lost Galaxy. Like I discussed earlier on, that Andros does uh, discover that his sister happens to be Astronema and that Darkonda was the suspect behind her abduction. Once Caron regains her memories once again, that wouldn't last for long when she eventually gets brainwashed again by Ecliptor, who was also uh, another villain that also had a bit of a good side to him. So... He was basically Astronomer's caretaker. And so he gets reprogrammed, much like what 
Carone would eventually later on. And so it was back to the status quo again. It looked like the final showdowns here, but not quite yet. And so we fast forward even after uh, Dark Spectre's Revenge when we get the uh, Psycho Rangers, which is also one of my favorite story arcs, and see the Power Rangers fighting off their doppelgangers. And that was just really intense. Of a, It was just really putting the Power Rangers at the biggest challenge and the way that they introduced the Psycho Rangers and just their presence really kind of showed just how menacing these guys were. And over the course of those episodes, you would get episodes where someone like TJ, because he was known for being a strategist. So he had to figure out how to uh, defeat the Psycho Rangers. And it's not just by, in terms of who is the most powerful Power Rangers. Like it's not all about brawn, but it's also factoring in mind and strategy. So I definitely really like that, how that kind of factors in into this whole saga. You know, you had like TJ and the rest of the crew uh, posing as the Blue Ranger and the Psycho Rangers are confused as to which one's the real Blue Ranger. And then, you know, Zane cosplaying as Psycho Silver, which was actually a really cool stuff. And I kind of wish that they, there was a, such a thing as a Psycho Silver because that was just only kind of a little bit of a tease. But it was also something that I kind of thought that maybe Power Rangers could have considered if they were to create their own Ranger suits. And we would get that a little later on with, you know, Lightspeed, Rescue, and Jungle Fury. But I it would have been cool to see, a, like, a Psycho Gold and a Psycho Silver. Um, but that did not happen here. You know, it is what it is. But, you know, I definitely really enjoyed this uh, particular story arc. Even Anjos gets his Battleizer as well. So that was pretty cool. And then Count on Destruction, basically the be all end all, basically a culmination of every event that has occurred throughout the six years of Power Rangers. Astrama leads the United Alliance of Evil and basically threatening to take over not only Earth, but also the rest of the whole galaxy. So, you know, you have this huge alliance, you have this huge. Uh, faction with all these main villains from past seasons coming back and they're taking over Diva Tox taking over Aquatar and Rita and Zed you know taking over another planet and you know they're fending off the likes of the Gold Ranger and I can't remember who was also there I think it might have been the Blue Centurion or the Phantom Ranger but it was definitely one of the past um, allies over the years that we've had and yeah, some really intense fight scenes with the Power Rangers and, you know, even coming up short with all the odds being thrown at them. They just feel very defeated. And there was actually a really cool moment where Bulk actually takes a stand and really uplifts every civilian spirits. So I thought that was really cool how Bulk managed to kind of take a stand for himself and really show what a being a hero is really like. Because you don't have to be like a superhero in spandex in order to be a hero or in order to uh, save the world or whatever. But, uh, but it goes to show that no matter who you are, everyone can be a hero that everyone could contribute to the world in order to make it a better place. So really shows just how much, how far that the bulk character and especially with skull, cause bulk and skull definitely, uh, came a long way since the days of Mighty Morphin where they were like these high school bullies that would pick on the Rangers. And now they're kind of at a point six years later where they've developed and matured into respected human beings. And I think that was really one of the reasons why a lot of viewers that have stuck by Power Rangers really grown to appreciate Bulk and Skull. And it definitely showed like in like towards the end of the episode where the Power Rangers are nowhere to be seen and you know the whole civilians of Angel Grove were all taking a stand they were all kind of uh, taking a stand against Astronema because you know the Rangers are nowhere to be seen and the civilians are because they're wondering exactly who the Power Rangers are like who are the people that are behind the suits 
and everyone's like saying i'm a ranger i'm a ranger i'm the red ranger the blue ranger the pink ranger they weren't afraid to back down of a fight and so they like fight off all the foot soldiers there and just some really cool defining moments in that finale and andros eventually uh doing the unthinkable and having to reluctantly destroy Zordon and his tube in order to wipe out all the evil that was posing as a threat to the galaxy. Count of Destruction, you know, was supposed to be the final episode of the entire franchise. And to think that this would have been the final episode is just completely mind-blowing to me. And Lord, who knows how different I would be as a fan of superheroes had Power Rangers ended in 1998 as opposed to continuing into the turn of the new millennium and you know fast forward here with shows like Beast Morphers and you know Ninja Steel and all the other recent Power Rangers seasons that we've had just imagine just what a superhero fan would be like in a world that now that Power Rangers once we got to the end of Power Rangers in 1998 it's like how bizarre that would have been just to not witness other seasons, other amazing seasons that came after that. But when it's all said and done, I was very glad just to see the culmination of everything that has happened. And, you know, we didn't get to see the the relationship between Andros and Ashley because that was also a thing that was developing during that time. And it's a shame that we didn't get to see kind of like that one romantic kiss between the two. And I believe that was supposed to happen. I, there was supposed to be a three-part episode as opposed to a two-parter. But that didn't happen there. But, you know, other than that, I definitely really loved the chemistry with um, Andros and Ashley. Power Rangers in Space, definitely my personal all-time favorite Power Rangers season. And especially here during the original Fox Kids heyday during the Saban era. That's basically all my list for some of my... Power Ranger seasons throughout the years, particularly the Saban era from the Mighty Morphin to Wild Force, and just in terms of what was my least favorite and what was my all-time favorite season. Feel free to share your thoughts down in the comment section below. I would definitely love to hear you guys' feedback. I'm hoping to do a Disney era Power Ranger rankings, but that probably won't be anytime soon. I want to kind of rewatch some of the Power Ranger seasons from that era first before I can make a statement or before I can make a judgment. Thank you all guys for watching, and till next time, this is the GSTV Reviewer, signing out.